Winnipeg is currently negative 26. And let's check Montreal, why not? Montreal is currently a mild negative 13. So yeah, obviously Canadian winter can get pretty intense, but there's one place that is notably more intense than any other, and that is Northern Canada. It takes a special kind of person to live up there. And in today's video, we're gonna to talk to one of those people. His name is Paige. Paige is also a local YouTuber from Montreal. Super cool content, you should check his stuff out. But today we're gonna to talk about Paige's experience living in Yellowknife, a city in the Northwest Territories of Canada. He actually moved there directly from New Zealand, so talk about like changing worlds. If I take one more step, it'll be the farthest away from home I've ever been. We're gonna hear Paige's experience. We're gonna learn a bit about Northern Canada. Hope you enjoy this. Let's get right to it. Okay, Paige, let's, let's get right to it. Tell me about life in Northern Canada. Okay, so back in uh, 2009, um, <laughs> I was not feeling very fulfilled with my life in New Zealand uh, and decided to head to Canada. So I went straight to Yellowknife, um, but I got off a plane in Vancouver and I was like, I don't know how cold this is. Like I've never walked outside and had it be like minus, you know, um, 10 before or whatever it was in Vancouver. And I remember I had my little like luggage trolley and I was like, Okay, here it goes. Here we go. Okay, hopefully I don't freeze. And I pushed it out the door and I was like, oh, it's just like a cold day. <laughs> this, is, this is okay, you know. But I was like, genuine. if you come from a warmer climate, you're just not quite sure what it's going to be, you know. Like, and we get a lot of like reality TV show. So Ice Road Truckers was really big and they would dramatize it like, Alex Demogoski's in Yellowknife, the Northwest Territories. His brake light has gone out and he might die <laughs> while changing the plug, you know? D did the extreme cold excite you or did it scare you or was there some... Well, I didn't want to be overconfident because they, it was sold as a very dangerous thing. I actually remember in New Zealand, I went into this liquor shop which had like a walk-in... Uh, mm. cooler and I was like how cold is it in there and they were like whatever it was like minus minus five and I went in there and was like okay so this is minus five and just kind of thought what that would mean as far as what clothes I wanted to wear <laughs> yeah find your local beer store that's training ground for Canada huh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's very embarrassing you've got some embarrassing texts here of like uh, what I <laughs> did before I came but yeah I showed up I showed up in yellow and I, I had like I had like a I really did have like a, I don't know like a thousand dollars saved <laughs> and a suit to go to a job interview. Wow. Um, and I needed to land a job for- A suit and a toque. No toque. And that's the, so I had no toque and that's amateur mistake. I was so, my ears hurt so much. Like I was trying to get to the job interview on my first day and it was not that far from um, like the hotel that I'd stayed in that night. But I was like, ah! <laughs> you know, it, it's really painful on your ears and your hands if you don't have them covered up, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that was those sorts of things. They do matter. That will change. They'll change how you behave. And I don't know if this is a separate point you want to hold on to, but of course there's the darkness as well. That's a big adjustment for people. The further north you go, I mean, going back to your second grade science class or whatever, the further north you go, the the less sunlight you're getting, especially in the winter months. Yeah. So it's like you when you hit to work in the morning, it's dark, and then when you come home, it's dark. You know. And so you do have to like seasonal affective disorder is a big concern there. You have yeah. to be like really proactive about winters and like we're just coming out of a COVID winter um, here and I used a lot of the tools that I'd learned in Yellowknife about getting through winter um, this last winter. Vitamin D? Uh, vitamin D is not as big a, is not really a big problem if you're like as pasty as I am um, <laughs> but yeah for sure like if you have darker skin that is actually a big issue like you need to make sure you're on top of that. Bigger things are more like Taking winter really seriously, like see if you have any sort of like uh, mental illnesses or you know if you're affected by depression, don't screw around. Like you gotta you gotta start exercising. Like in in the fall, you gotta like um, plan for it. Uh, are you gonna have a break midwinter? You know, um, are you gonna are you gonna keep in contact with certain friends? You're gonna watch out for each other. Like mm. winter in Yellowknife is a serious thing, you know, and you treat it as such. And if you do that, you'll be fine. But a lot of people my first few years up there, I just went into it like I would winter in New Zealand. And it's a totally different beast. You were telling me a moment ago that there are, there's a wave of immigrants moving from Africa to places like Yellowknife. Is that, is that correct? 
Yeah, yeah. Yellowknife. Was it Ethiopia you mentioned? Uh, North African. North so Africans. Ethiopians are there. Yeah, for sure. There's like two yeah. Ethiopian restaurants in Yellowknife, um, <laughs> which is crazy. So good. Zahabesha. <laughs> Like, it is legit, like, the best restaurant in town. I and, never would have guessed that. Yeah, well, there's basically, like, ways of immigrants arrive in Yellowknife. Uh, the latest is, like, the North Africans. But before then, it was, like, um, like Lebanese and, like, um, you know, more, like, like Arabic um, yeah, yeah. kind of countries. And then, uh, yeah, before then, the Vietnamese um, made a big showing, you know. So there's just kind of, like, yeah, there's waves. And they come in and they settle the Filipinos. Huge community. Yeah, there's these separate world, worlds. It is quite a, like, I mean, and this kind of goes into some of the negative stuff. It is quite a segregated society in a lot of ways. Certain, there's, um, so Dilo, for example, is this, like, Aboriginal community that is attached to Yellowknife, and the only people that live there are part of the Yellowknife's Dene First Nation or other mm. Aboriginal groups. And so you do end up being, like, oh, that part of town is an Aboriginal part of town, and then this part of town is a white person part of town. And so you do have, like, this, um weirdness of like a very small town where there's you'll there'll be like even the francophones like you'll be at a party and you'll be like these um who are these guys you know like a whole mm. bunch of a whole bunch of dudes with like pistaches and like they're very dapper where are they from and you're like when you get a little closer and you hear the french you're like oh it's the french group but like i don't know why for some reason the groups are often quite it, it, like operate in separate worlds um you know which is unfortunate because it actually would have been on reflection i wish i'd spent more time Getting into like the Filipino, you know, society and like just, I don't know, there's a lot of opportunities missing. I, I wanna, I wanna, I wanna jump in and ask a quick question here because I mean, obviously, like indigenous populations to northern Canada uh, make up a sizable percentage of the population. There's a long history there of indigenous groups in northern Canada, especially. Uh, now, New Zealand also has a lot of indigenous groups to New Zealand who I was talking with another uh, friend who spent time in New Zealand, and she was saying that, in her opinion, New Zealand, the relations between, you know, the new arrivals, the Europeans, the white people, whatever, and the indigenous people is better than it is in Canada. She was saying, Canada, we have more problems. Is that something you would echo? Do you think we're, do you think New Zealand is somehow doing better than Canada? Uh, yeah, so... You could go, you could talk about this forever, and a lot of people won't enjoy hearing like a, a white foreigner talking about this subject. But um, in my experience, the Maori, um, Maori population of New Zealand, which represents about 10% of the population of the country, um, is more empowered and a little more cohesive in, in its kind of approach to dealing with the government. I think a lot of that is just the product of. Um, being a smaller country, mm. there is no Aboriginal in Canada. You know what I mean? Like there are so many different Aboriginal groups. Different histories, different identities. Yeah. So when you yeah. do, when you say something like, "Hey, let's unite around like uh, supporting Aboriginal languages," in the Northwest Territories, there are seven maybe official Aboriginal languages. I can't even remember. Wow. The, the, these aren't like the Inuit who live on the coast and the inland like First Nations like Dene population. They didn't even historically get along. They speak totally different languages, totally different cultures. You know, like one is like, one is live in igloo, one is live in teepee, you know what I mean? Like it's t they're as different as, I don't know, Russians from Vietnamese, you know what I mean? In terms of like what they're, what they're focused on. Um, and so, yeah, it's really hard for uh, when the government's trying to deal with like communicate with them it's it's the from the very start you're like well who who are they <laughs> you know that, that, <laughs> that's probably a really important reminder to canadians as well i think myself and a lot of people probably fall into that trap of just thinking about indigenous population mm -hmm. without actually seeing that nuance of the different histories and the different existences yeah. right and you will like once you if you live in the north you'll have like friends from for example inuit friends and and like friends who are first nations and you can tell just from like even the conversation you're having with them, like they're very different, D very very different cultures. So like, yeah, it's um, it makes it a little harder. Whereas in New Zealand, the Maori are much more um, homogenous. So it's you know they united around one language, Te Reo Maori, yeah. which uh, is kind of the like standard Maori dialect. And so when you're like, oh, we want to preserve our culture, it immediately is just so much more straightforward. Canada has a bigger challenge you know when it comes to that stuff in new zealand so i don't want to give new zealand a like good job new zealand it's it, it's a lot harder yeah yeah that's a really interesting perspective uh obviously your, your lived experience is very different than that of those in the, these different canadian communities so what was it like for you arriving in canada 
Yeah, so for sure, like, I didn't... <laughs> not an Aboriginal person, and I'm not even from Canada. So <laughs> my experience was, like, pretty typical, I think. Like, there's a lot of people that move up to Yellowknife and spend some time there and then leave at some point. Like, this kind of rotation of, like, fresh southern, like, people um, who do various, like, white-collar things. Um, the surprise to me was that I see you're taking taking that taking that nice tropical punch. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. All right, <laughs> keeping it tropical here on the new travel. So sorry, go on, Paige. So one thing that you one thing you are often surprised by um, is that the industry up there and what people do is not mining. You know, um, there historically huh. it was, and it's sold on TV. But the reality is, like most people you know, are going to be in Yellowknife at least working for the government or working for someone who works for the government. You're sitting in, a, in an office and you're typing on a computer and you're screwing around playing Minesweeper or whatever. It's just like someone living in the South, you know? And so there's a romanticized kind Calling of- out the Canadian government workers out there. Holy crap, yeah. Doing stuff, okay, Yellowknife. There's this concept, I gotta tell you about this. I think it's kind of funny. Yeah. There's this concept my buddy has called doing Yellowknife right. Okay, um, Which I've actually like really, I've taken to heart as a general life philosophy, you know, wherever you are, are you doing the place you live right? Mm. So doing Montreal right to me is like not working all the time and spending time focusing on your hobbies and things that are fulfilling, right? Because like our cost of living is relatively low. So do do Montreal right. Now doing Yellowknife right is working a government job and off the side of your desk doing a private business like getting something spun up, you know, because <laughs> the expectation in Yellowknife is that you work for you can get that work done very, very quickly, and then you have all this free time, and you can t write emails, research stuff, figure stuff out, you know. That's doing Yellowknife, right? That's a surprisingly <laughs> good pitch for moving to Yellowknife. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the downside, if you want to talk about, like, the negatives of let's, it. Let's get into it, yeah. Okay, so, a lot of people, once you get through your first year, you'll have all this kind of, like, novelty and fun experiences you'll get to you'll get the northern lights and the snow castle like in the winter they build a um, snow castle out on the lake and there's like you're dancing around inside there and, and you're, having... you're brushing past the northern lights was it cool the first time seeing it or were you just like meh lights northern lights are basically like crap fireworks um <laughs> You know, no, I mean, I have to say, like... You, ju you just put North Northwest Territories uh, Tourism Board on Suicide Watch. You'll, like, see the tourists, like, bumping around downtown, trying to get uh, a photo underneath the Center Square Mall minus 40 sign. Bumping around downtown. And they're, like, they're, they're, like, they're walking around, they go into the tourist shops and buy stuff, and you, s I often felt just, like, really sorry for them, because sometimes it'd just be, like, overcast for the whole week. Oh, and no. They've flown over there to see the Northern Lights. And so you have this, like, it's really hard to see... Could you imagine just flying all the way from Germany or something it's just cloudy yeah happens all the time it happens all the time oh. yeah like there's no guarantees about seeing the northern lights you know because you have this thing right that's it's a magnetic storm right yeah you have to book a flight like weeks ahead you don't know what the like what the solar storms are going to be yeah and you don't know what the actual climate's going to be so when they show up it's very possible that even if it's like an if it's a clear skies day that they're just kind of like minor little trickles and the the, the fucking photography, they use this like long exposure like technique to make them look like a, a sea of like colors in the, in the sky. And they look really cool, but they just don't look like the photos. You it's know? one of those like it's, Instagram versus reality type things. Yeah, it's really, <laughs> it's really bad. So yeah, you'd just be like, people would show up. And like I used to do, I used to host couch surfers and I had to stop hosting them, not because I didn't want to like help people out, but because I got so tired of having this depressed, bummed out, like, Swedish <laughs> couch surfer sitting there like, I came all the way here to see the Northern Lights and, uh, there's nothing to see. It's very, uh, very sad. Do you have any soup? I'm quite cold, my hands, I did not have for yet, you know. <laughs> Swedish is actually probably a bad example, they had their own Northern Lights. Oh but my would, god. Yeah, there's just so many, like, just, oh, I'm sorry, man, yeah, it's like that sometimes. Yeah, that's the first, that's the first year, things are new, falling out of love with Northern Lights. Well, I'll tell you what's, what's kind of funny is, I didn't even think about the Northern Lights, and I was walking home from uh, a friend's house one night, Yeah. and I was like, ha, huh, Northern Lights, oh yeah, those, those are here. <laughs> <laughs> that's when it's nice to see the northern lights when you're like surprised by them and they keep you company when you're walking home at night and those are the moments where yeah you know when you just happen across it that spontane spontaneous form of northern lights that's that's, that's great. Best. Yeah, yeah i really like that um yeah so i like lived i lived in an igloo for a month 
uh, on a bet. Someone said I couldn't do it, so I was like, I'm... Whoa, 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 pause, pause. For a month? Yeah. <laughs> Dude. Yeah, someone was Sto like... Story time. Yeah, this lady I was working with was like, you can't live in an igloo. And I'm like, of course you can live in an igloo. People lived in igloos forever. Obviously, you can live in an igloo. And so she, she was like acting like it was impossible. And I was like, obviously, it's not sensible, but you can. So I like went and built an igloo. And I lived in it for a month. And I used to walk it. So I'd walk across Back Bay to the igloo to sleep in it. And on, often on those nights walking across the bay, you know, because you're just trudging for like 20 minutes in a straight line, you would see the northern lights and they were beautiful. Like that was really nice. Okay, that's a viral YouTube video waiting to be made. Shout out, <laughs> leave a comment if you want to see Paige living in an igloo for a month. We're going to get it back up there. God, I actually had, I did film a lot of that. Um, so I never, I was going to make a documentary, never, never got around to it. Um, but yeah, anyway, lived in an igloo for a month. Um, and I won a pair of skates. That is the most Canadian <laughs> experience you could possibly have. <laughs> I bet you a pair of skates you can't live in an igloo for a month. <laughs> no, I think I can. Ah, take back Canada. So when you're not out building igloos, what was it like with the other people in Yellowknife? What was the community like? Yeah, so um, first of all, there are a lot of lesbians in Yellowknife, um, which is surprising, but for some reason, that town, like it's got these like odd quirky things to it, and that's one of them. There's a very vibrant, like, um, female gay community there um, that are kind of like uh, drawn to the place. Um, so you end is, up with is, this. Sorry, is the community accepted by the general public? Oh is yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Pretty open place for that. Yeah, Yellowknife is extremely conservative, but in that kind of like we don't like change sort of conservative, but not in most social ways. So like most of those modern values that you see as progressive, very accepted in the north. Um, the things which are conservative are just the like. Um, changing anything from what it is already, that, that sort of conservatism. Interesting. Yeah, so progressive, it's like a, it's like a conservative liberal place, if that makes huh. sense. What was your favorite season when you were living there? Did you prefer the winter, the summer, um, spring, fall? Everyone, most people who've lived there long term really like the summer, especially the like, local kids, but it's actually quite a crappy summer, like it's not very good um, compared to like other places, you know, it's just relatively mm. seems awesome. But I really love this, this day usually in spring where it just is abnormally warm on one day and it's bright because the, like by then the sun's actually changed its position quite a bit in mm. the sky. And every and you, f you can hear the melting sound of the um, of all of the snow because it doesn't melt during winter at all. And there's this one day where it finally bumps and it goes way above zero, you know, in the daylight hours. Yeah. Um, and the radiant energy is really hot. And you, you hear the sound of all this dripping water, like it's raining almost, as all the snow that's been sitting there for like six months um, starts to melt. That day is awesome, <laughs> you know. So let's take a step back. Are you, is it above, I don't even know, I'm a bad Canadian. Is it above the tree line? Like what's the geography like around Yellowknife? Which, Flat snow everywhere, or what does it look like? It's these tiny little stumpy trees, you yeah. know? Um, so it's just silver birch and, uh, and a coniferous tree. I can't remember what type. And uh, that's it. Like, that's, that's actually something that's really funny. There's such a small range of flora and fauna uh, <laughs> that exists there during the winter. There's ravens, foxes, the two sorts of trees. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's obviously a moose and stuff, like wolves, you, but you they're like far away from the city. So you don't see moose walking down the main street? No. You don't see you. They'll be like, oh, there's a, there's a black bear that uh, someone saw here. You know, like, oh, there's a wolf. You know, like, you know, like, it'd be like a couple of years ago, if you dig into the news archives, it'd be like a dog got eaten by a wolf. You know, that sort of thing. Yeah. But uh, you know, no, generally, like, as far as what you actually come across, oh, there's ptarmigan, the bird. You know, so, so yeah, it's like um, foxes, ptarmigan, the two sorts of trees, and ravens. And then people really love the ravens because you you end up being like, those guys are real. Those guys are a real deal. They stick around, you know. <laughs> All these other animals, like there's these gulls, like herring gulls that show up during the summer, and you're like, these guys are just here for summer, you know. Shout out to my ravens. <laughs> yeah. Res so, respect. Yeah, people love the ravens, and yeah, you actually this is a super okay. This is a super deep cut yellow knife thing. People, there's these legends about ravens, so they'll be like, Ooh. yeah, they'll be like. Oh, I saw a raven dot dot dot. So these these kind of like, oh, I saw a raven leading a dog out onto the ice so that it fell through. Oh, I saw a raven solving this puzzle. I saw a raven, 
you know, and be, so they kind of, you'll hear these kind of tales of these genius ravens, like, you know, picking locks and like solving math equations or whatever, you know, and they kind of like become like urban legends. You know? So the, the question is, Paige, did you, did you see a raven? Did you have that moment? I actually, so, okay, this one, this one's 100% true. I once saw a raven completing a seed funding form to get a garbage-based disposal business. Um, I swear to God, like, it was, it's pretty crazy. It opened the account, filled in the form, you know, and, like, started this garbage disposal business. Okay, this interview is over. <laughs> Thanks, Paige. <laughs> See you next time, YouTube. Bye. Yeah. Paige just snuck off to get another beer. Uh, we got, like, one more question I'm going to ask him before we go. This is one of my longer videos, I think, but I hope you've enjoyed it. Let me know what you think of this format. Longer conversations with Canadians, other YouTubers, other travelers. For me, I think conversations are power. I think there's really something to diving the longer form content. It's just hard to know if people have the intention span for this kind of thing. So if you are into it, definitely let me know. Paige is back. Oh, what do you have this time? Another Canadian uh, treat. Oh, hell yeah, Caesar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if Caesars are as big in Quebec, but I know like where I grew up in Manitoba in a lot of parts of Canada, that is the drink. My God, yeah, like Wings Wednesday and Caesars were like immediately. <laughs> Wing Wednesday, yeah, yeah, that's a thing in the north as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember like I bumped into this dude Davis of you watching, uh, and he was like, I was like, where are you going? And he's like, I'm off to Wings, and I'm like, Wings, and I, like I was like, what is that? Is it a restaurant? He's like, Wings Wednesday, like I was. Like, I was like, so what's this? what do you mean? What are you talking about? Wings Wednesday. I gotta say, like, chicken wings are, like, an awesome North American food. And, yeah, like, I really like, I really like the Caesars, you know? Like, I like, I like my tomatoes. It's perfect. As, as a foreigner, there are yeah. things that are, like, North Americans are all like, oh, we don't have culture and stuff. No, you, you do. They're just, like, you're so used to them that you don't realize they are. This video <laughs> is sponsored by Julius Bloody Caesar, the top, <laughs> the top drink in Paige's fridge. Cool. Well, I think that's about it for today. I have my tiki bar to finish. Paige has a Caesar. Cheers, man. Thanks for being on the new travel. Yeah. And hope this has given some insight into life in Northern Canada. Uh, I've never been up there, actually. I've never been above Edmonton. I'm a bad Canadian. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. A lot of uh, when I talk about you know, what I'm up to with, with people. Yeah. They're like, oh, yeah, okay, whatever, you're from New Zealand, I don't care. Oh, you lived in Yellowknife? You know, people, people are really interested in that place. I don't know. It's, it's kind of funny. Well, if any Canadian tourism people are watching this and want to fly me up to the north, I will definitely go on that trip. Hope I didn't uh, burn any bridges with Paige's view. But I think overall you have a pretty... I mean, you've been very truthful about the good and the bad of life in the north, northern Canada. And I think that's really what's going to help people who are interested in that area, you know? I would say to any, like, any Canadian, if you're out of university or whatever, or you're not too sure what to do, going up to Yellowknife and spending a year there is a great idea. Like, it's uh, doing the whole cycle. And if you're doing, like, a, um, uh, if you've got, like, a working holiday visa, so you're someone from Australia, New Zealand, or, or Britain, it's a great choice. It's so Canadian. <laughs> you know, you're getting maximum Canadian. So maybe skip like Whistler or the more popular spots and do the year there, you know, for a real legitimate Canadian experience. It'll, you'll have fun. It'll be, it'll be absolutely like unforgettable. Awesome. Well, speaking of time to go, I think it's time for this video to go. Shout out to Paige. Good job in the video. And uh, yeah, see you all next time. Peace. All right. Yeah. You think it's going to be fun to edit? Well, it'll be a lot of footage, but you can get all my hot takes, you know. Hey guys, thanks a lot for making it to the end of the video. Like most of my videos, there are no sponsors on this uh, content. So this is made possible by the generous support of people like those names you see floating by my head. <laughs> if you would also like to see your name floating by my head, uh, here's a couple ways that you can support. Uh, even for a couple dollars a month, it really, really means a lot. It allows me to keep doing this, my dream job, of showing people that the world is not as scary as they think. As always, super grateful for your viewership, and I will catch you next time. Peace.